Hey everybody. Well, last week I put out a video on how I built this little garage mini furnace out of a Chinese diesel heater. And I got a lot of views and a lot of comments on that. Now, luckily none of the comments were real bad, like, oh, this is a disaster. You're gonna kill yourself. It's gonna blow up on you. But there were a few corrections that I thought necessary to make based on the comments. And also a lot of good suggestions to improve the, either the efficiency or safety of the unit. So before I move on to my next project, I thought I'd go ahead and focus the last week of using this and make some of these improvements so that I can make this the best install it can be and show you the best way to install these as well. So stay tuned to see the six user corrections and or suggestions that you guys made to help me out. Now, the most common uh, critical comment that I got was that my exhaust was shaped like a P-trap, which could trap water in it. Now, the reason for that is twofold. One is when you get that exhaust tube, you'll notice that it has smooth swaged ends on it, and you have to use those smooth ends in order to connect them to your fittings. If you cut into the corrugated part of the pipe, there's no way to swage it and properly clamp it onto your end. So you have to use the whole pipe. You may be able to cut off a little bit of the excess uh, swaged ends, but that's about all you can do. So I had to put that excess pipe somewhere, so I just bent it downward. The other thing I'm aware of is the fact that unlike a high efficiency furnace that you may have in your house, this exhaust gets extremely hot. And I just kind of assumed that any little moisture that was caught in that trap would be steamed out by way of the exhaust getting really hot. But what I failed to take into consideration is if I had a large amount of water coming in from the outside flange, like for example, if I power wash the siding or something like that, I could fill up that P-trap. As well, when I took the P-trap off, it was bone dry. But that's because it is the winter time. Our air has the least amount of humidity right now. In the spring when it's still cold out, but the air has a much higher humidity, I could end up with condensation trapped in there. So I wanted to go ahead and address it. So this is what I did. First off, the exhaust flange that I mounted to the wall, it would have been nice if I would have sized it and mounted it a little bit lower so that I kept it a little lower from the unit and I had more room to work with. But because changing that would be a very difficult task, what I instead did was I was able to raise the unit up a few inches, about three inches up above, and then remounted it onto the wall. That allowed me to get a nice bend in, and then although not a drastic angle, I was able to get at least a slight angle all the way back toward the exhaust. Now I still had the problem with the excess pipe that I needed to deal with. But instead of a downward angle bend, I put a saddle bend in it horizontally so that it still takes up the slack, but it still has an overall downward slope into the exhaust flange. Now, in addition to this, I thought, well, why not upgrade my clamps while I'm at it? So I got some of these Mickey Mouse shaped, heavy duty stainless steel exhaust clamps. I highly recommend getting these. They're only about three to four dollars a piece, depending on how many you buy, but they really do have a massive amount of clamping power and surface area. It'll ensure the safety of your exhaust. In addition to that, I also wrapped it in this one inch heat tape that's designed for motorcycle exhausts. That'll prevent any safety issues where if something like wood falls underneath here or my fuel line will we'll keep from getting singed or melted. So I thought that was an, a great upgrade to the safety of it. Now, speaking of that fuel line, you'll notice that it is now not using that green fuel line. That's the second thing that was suggested is that I upgrade my fuel line. Now I was gonna put off upgrading the fuel line because I thought, well, I can go a season or two with that green stuff. But then I read somewhere that not only that green stuff deteriorates and will not last about a year or two. But the other reason to upgrade the fuel line is something that I just learned. And that is those fuel pumps, they pulse the fuel out, right? And those pulsings create pressure within the pipe. And one of the problems with this green stuff is how soft and rubbery it is. When the fuel pump 
pulses the fuel, this stuff will expand and contract due to its softness. When it does that, you lose some of the kinetic energy that the fuel pump is expecting to push the fuel forward. So getting a more stiffer and more rugged fuel line will help with the fuel efficiency. There's a couple different upgrades you can make here. One common option is that white, harder plastic tubing. I think it's made of a nylon material, and that's a good upgrade. What I did is I just went to my local auto parts store and just got 3 16 inner diameter automotive grade fuel line. This stuff is thicker walled, it's, it's still stiff, and it's easy to work with. Now the third suggestion, well I actually this would be considered a correction that was given to me by the commenters, was the fact that my fuel pump was just bracketed horizontally onto the bottom of the case and didn't have the angle or lift that it should have. And that was not called out at all in the instructions, but online if you read that yes, these should have some kind of angle or lift on the output side of the pump. And as you can see, what I did was I took, I happen to have a few of these three inch angle brackets in my hardware stash. So I took one and I bent it to about a 30 degree angle and I mounted the pump to that. So that was an easy fix. But that's absolutely true in that you should have an upward slope on the output side of your fuel pump. I can't remember the reason why, but it, that is what the manufacturer suggests. Now, another thing that was mentioned was the fact that my fuel filter looked like it was upside down. Now, the reason for that is, as you can see in the manual, it clearly shows the blue side of that filter on the gas tank or input side. But the reason that the commenters brought this up is because they're probably familiar with small engines. And if you've ever seen an inline gas filter that, say, on a riding lawnmower, the typical way to orient these is on the broader side, the side that has the filter element on it, that typically is the output side. And the rounder or smaller side is typically the input. So I went ahead and reoriented it that way. The reason I think the instructions had it the other way is because there is no flow direction embossed into these. Typically these will have a flow direction arrow embossed or, or painted onto these filters. There was nothing like that on this one. And it doesn't have that pleated kind of paper or whatever orange tile element in it. It just has like a little stainless screen inside of it. So my guess is, is that it doesn't really matter the direction for this particular type of filter. But I went ahead and oriented the way I'm used to seeing it as well. Okay, so the fifth suggestion that I got was the fact that I did not route my combustion air to the exterior of the workshop. I only routed the exhaust to the outside. The proper way to do this is to route both the combustion intake and exhaust to the exterior. The exhaust should not be breathing in the heated air. It makes the furnace much less efficient. Now you probably have seen off-grid cabin installations of these particular heaters in probably two different ways. One, where it's in a weatherproof box on the outside of the cabin and only the vent tubing is brought inside in which case the combustion air, both the intake and exhaust, can just kind of route outside of the casing in opposite directions. So that's kind of an easy way to do that. But another common approach is to mount the unit inside of the structure, in which case you absolutely need to route both the combustion and the exhaust outside. Now mine's a little bit of a hybrid setup here. So notice I have it run through this wall into this drywalled garage here. Now this is my garage and this is this is a drywalled and insulated building. It's bolted onto this other building here as you can see and that is what I call my workshop which is not insulated. The idea behind this is I have this little tent wall here that I can bring down to kind of wall off the opening between the workshop and the garage. So the reason I did it this way is I'm sort of in a hybrid approach here. I'm still mounting the furnace inside of the unit, so I want to make sure the exhaust goes outside, but for the most part, this workshop, while the heater's running and while I have this wall down, the workshop should remain cold. That's why I didn't route the combustion air to the outside. Now there may be some other reasons to route that. I've heard maybe some people say that when it's cycling down, sometimes exhaust can backfeed out of the air intake. 
things like that. So I still may do it in the future, but for right now, that's kind of the reasoning behind the way I did it. Now, the sixth and final suggestion that I got that was a great idea was to run this unit off of a battery. The reason for that is because if I was to have a power outage while this thing was running, it could hurt the unit. And the reason being is because when you turn off the unit at the keypad, it doesn't immediately just shut off, right? It does a cool down and whatever. It does a shutdown cycle, right? A process. And if my power was to suddenly shut off and my power supply or my power supply died, what would happen is it wouldn't be able to do that cycle and it may damage the unit. So there's two ways I could probably approach this issue. Um, I haven't done them now, but I'm, I'm considering this in the future. One approach is to do a small backup battery. And the idea here is I could get one of those little sealed lead acid 12 volt batteries, like a UPS battery, stick it in here and splice my positive and negative off the power supply and basically hook the battery positive and negative in parallel to the power supply. Essentially what that would be is like my car electrical system where this is equivalent to the alternator. So when the car is off, it's running off the battery. But when the car is running, the alternator has a slightly higher voltage than the battery. Therefore, it takes over all of the electrical duties of the car while it's running, as well as constantly charging or topping off that lead acid battery. So that's one approach, but you have to make sure you have a battery that's capable of being overcharged all the time. And, and I think most UPS batteries could do that. Another approach you could take is potentially change that power supply out to a smart battery charger and get like a lithium battery pack or maybe an AGM battery pack that's at 12 volts and run that as your main battery, meaning that this unit runs only off the main battery and the main battery is simply charged while the unit is running. So the consideration there is you would have to make sure that the battery pack and charger can supply more charging amperage to the battery than what the unit can draw so that you don't end up depleting the battery and it going out while it's running. But those are both great options. Now, the reason I'm not in a hurry to do either one of those is because I live in the northern Midwest and we rarely have severe weather and power outages as a result of severe weather. And even if we do have severe weather, I'm normally not in the garage working. So I think I'm fairly safe to uh, put that kind of upgrade off, but I may end up getting one of those little sealed lead acid batteries and going with that battery option. But if you're doing an implementation on like an off-grid solar system or on generator power or any kind of power that isn't reliable, you may want to consider those two options. That wraps up those six corrections and or upgrades that you guys gave me. And I really appreciate all the great comments and the very thoughtful and smart people that are watching my videos and making those suggestions to me. If you're new to my channel and you're into things like this, garage DIY or home DIY upgrades, as well as some long running projects of restoring this 78 bus and converting it to an electric vehicle. If those topics interest you, please consider subscribing. And thanks for watching this video and I'll talk to you on the next one.